And with that, we gained access to another instance of all the resources. Even to oil through cold liquefaction, although the coal patch is by far the smallest of the lot, and it will have to double duty as coal and oil. But hey, we have some resources, we have some space, and although we still have a lot of work to do before we can declare world peace, the future is looking bright. Very bright. Extremely bright. It's been exactly 200 days since I crash landed on this godforsaken planet. 200 days of hiding in the forests, running from life from these hive mind like creatures. They seem to know. Ugh. Their intelligence is low, but their numbers seem near unlimited, and their empire reaches as far as my raiders can see and beyond. It is only after fighting the fiercest of battles, I finally managed to secure enough of a foothold from where there seems hope. Hope. Along with access to all of the vital resources I need to grow bigger, stronger and set up a bigger base. One which is not solely focused on pure survival, but at least partly focused on production and revenge. Don't forget about revenge. Yes, after 200 days on this planet, we are finally no longer at the point where every decision is vital to our immediate survival. This heavily spaghettified base was designed and built with a single purpose, and that purpose has been fulfilled. Now there is no meaningful way to expand this base any further, that's just one of the consequences of building a spaghetti base. But this base has done its job, and it's done so excellently. We won't tear this base down, we leave it up as our legacy. A reminder to stay humble as our power and influence will surely grow further and further with time. We'll come visit from time to time. Thank you, base, for carrying me, and thank you, the viewer, for the incredible support and motivation you've given me throughout this series. Thank you for all the nice comments, as well as the honest feedback, and thank you for your monetary support through super thanks, paypal, and joining my patreon to support me in this journey and the next. Well, it's been an incredible journey, but yet here we are. It seems like we have finally passed the point where we can fail this challenge at any moment now. Due to the former meticulous importance of every small detail, we've spent the first 10 episodes covering just 16 hours of game time. Now we can speed up. Because after our conquest of the new resources, all those small decisions simply don't affect the overall outcome of the game anymore. So we're gonna skip over those as much as we can, and focus solely on the larger picture and big decisions. That will hopefully make sure the rest of this playthrough will remain as interesting as up until this point, while maintaining a high pace. So stop rambling already and get to work, that new factory ain't gonna build itself. So as you may have noticed, I like to keep relics around, stuff to remind me about what got us through the game up to this point. So while we reclaim the modules, we leave these old defunct miners to rust away in peace. Now in the new base, yellow belts shall not pass as adequate. 
So we finally set up some red belts, leeching straight off the source like some tecton parasite. Well, the most pressing issue is our trickling copper supply, so we'll set that up first. It fits 60 miners, which is plenty for one red belt. Of course, that means we need to double the copper furnace setup then too, as the current setup is suited for just one yellow belt. The new copper source will finally ensure some more decent chip production in all the three colors of the Factorio rainbow. I upgrade my armor with double the roboports, placing me in command of 100 bots at once. This will greatly speed up the building time of new projects, and we have a lot of new projects. We are not planning to set up automated yellow and purple signs in this base. But it's gonna be a long while before we have signs running again, and to properly set up our new base we need a few more elements. The means to set up a logistics network, the ability to build beacons, some Mark III assembly machines for selected projects, and not to forget coal liquefaction, so we can produce oil from coal. And perhaps the productivity module 3 will come in handy as well. We are not fully safe yet though. All of our new walls are undefended and will fall within just a couple attacks. So let's uh, take down the backup defense now. Isn't that the wrong order? Ah, okay, that's what I was referring to. Let's set up roboports to defend our new walls. And then I witnessed the strangest robo-split I've ever seen. It took me a good while to figure out what happened. Do you remember I hide away my repair packs in the logistic trash slots to prevent my personal construction bots from taking them? Yes? Well, it turns out the roboport bound bots have unionized and have been granted extra rights, as apparently they treat my logistic trash slots in the same way as a physical yellow storage chest, and they just came over to pick up some of the available repair packs I hide away in there. But Michael, you may say, fellow, dude, good old man, your base is not exactly rectangular now is it? Won't the repair bots constantly fly over the enemy nests and get utterly obliterated on their way to repair the walls? Yes. Yes they will, at least if we make one large roboport network. That is why we are going to make several smaller, independent roboport networks instead, to prevent that from happening. We will basically divide my awkwardly shaped base into rectangles. That will hopefully completely prevent bots from flying outside of our walls at all. We kinda need to get this done fast though, as here a single attack destroys 4 wall pieces, and most of our walls are still undefended. With the former severe copper bottleneck solved, production and thus pollution is growing rapidly again. It is now Factorio Day 221, and I finally managed to get provisionary bot coverage on all the walls. Keeping the roboports as far from the walls as possible, as well as separating the bots into 5 different roboport networks should keep them out of trouble. The disadvantage is, I will need to keep a keen eye on making sure none of the 5 individual networks run out of supplies. Speaking of supplies, we've gathered enough of them to upgrade to fusion reactors. Though I have to admit, the solar panels, which have been buffed up to 3 times the power output since the olden days, were keeping up quite well. Still, the fusion reactors are about twice as powerful on average. 
Not only do they have over 50% more power output during the day, they also don't shut down completely during the night. However, it may just be the case that those solar panels may make an unexpected return later. The two desired yellow tags have completed. Now we need to set up temporary purple production signs in the same way as we set up the yellow high tech signs. But we cannot, because we're out of stone. So it's time to cover the next resource patch with a blanket of stinking dirty miners. Ah, just look at that perfectly symmetric setup. Pure satisfaction. Now we are ready for purple signs. Let's get to work on the ingredients. So here's a whole bunch of electric furnaces worth of resources. And a whole bunch of productivity modules. And contrarily to the previous two, two fully automated rail assemblers. And that's everything basically. That was quick wasn't it? Not much later we can start up our temporary production science production. We stole the productivity module 2's from the idle yellow science assemblers and it's actually set up exactly the same way, with two ingredients inserted directly into the assemblers and the third ingredient divided over the supply chests. Again, four walls are destroyed in a single attack. And we're not even up against the 10 times more beefy behemoth biters yet. But as we take a look at the pollution spreading like crazy, the fierce attacks shouldn't come as a surprise. Alright, with production science out of the way, we can start thinking about the next step. The best power is green power. Eyeballing that shiny uranium patch, we prepare by barreling some sulfuric acid. The clock is ticking though, as we have already fully mined up the coal patch into chests and our oil buffer tanks are dwindling rapidly. We need to get the show on the road before any of those run out. So let's start by building and connecting the coal mine to our base. We prioritize the starter coal patch, ensuring that the new coal patch only chips in when the starter supply is insufficient. You cannot think about uranium processing and nuclear power without thinking about concrete. So we leach some water of the oil refineries to produce a couple of chests full. But do you know what's also needed for uranium processing and nuclear power? No, what? Actually researching the text of uranium processing and nuclear power. All right. <sighs> After a quick sanitary pit stop at the spaceship, let's head over to build the mines to supply our future mean lean green machine. Yet another very symmetric mine, it just pleases the eye. Of course we need to have the green modules in here as well. Now we just need to go fetch those barrels of sulfuric acid we prepared earlier. As well as an inventory full of resources to craft 24 uranium centrifuges. Ah uh, again super handy these logistic trash slots. 
You won't be able to use this method for much longer anymore though. But until then, we're gonna abuse the heck out of our 33 inventory slot. We set up the uranium processing and get to work on extracting shiny green rocks from the raw uranium ore. The next morning, we wake up to two of the highly desired extra shiny uranium-235 already. You know what, controlling 100 bots just is not enough. Now we have the portable fusion reactors, let's double up again to control 200 bots, shall we? Meanwhile, we bring a second batch of 800 barrels to the uranium mine. From the first batch, it has produced about 3000 uranium-238 and 24 uranium-235. Pretty close to the expected ratio of 0.7%. That means, statistically speaking, this next batch of sulfuric acid should push us past the point where we could start up the uranium enrichment process. That requires you to save up at least 40 of these extra shiny light green rocks which you can then use to turn the common dark green rocks into the shiny rare light green rocks at will. Contrary to popular belief, there's absolutely no need to set aside your first 40 light green rocks for some later late game reason. That's one of the most stubborn myths in Factorio and it seems to be impossible to get rid of. So we just take most of our shiny rocks and turn them into 200 fuel cells for our first nuclear reactor. Like mentioned before, our oil reserves are dwindling rapidly, but we can go and increase the production rate somewhat. <sighs> Walking down to the oil field is such an easy stroll compared to trying to sneak past the nest like before our expansion. Let's go say hi to Johnny's cousins. Now, oil is a little different than the other resources in Factorio. Oil is the only infinite resource and after 20 hours of operating with a linear decline in production, a pump jack reaches its minimum capacity, which it will then proceed to produce for the rest of the game. So we can increase that minimum capacity with some simple speed modules by a whopping 40%. Now an extra 40% of not much still equals not much, but hey, it's free real estate, we're not gonna turn it down. The modules we produce for the remaining labs are ready, so let's go and put them in. Oh right, we can actually connect that belt then. Now then, we are ready to go build the nuclear power plant. I'm gonna handcraft it all, just so I can say I handcrafted a complete 4 core nuclear power plant by myself. Next to the 4 nuclear reactors, we need 48 heat exchangers. And yes, I did especially clear the dedicated bot and equipment slots from my inventory just for this occasion, 96 steam turbines. Finally, we need 230 heat pipes because that's just how many heat pipes my design requires. And then, yes, this is the first time I'm using a pre-made blueprint, but it is my own design. Some things in Factorio are only fun to puzzle out once, and designing a nice looking, symmetrically hand-wired, non-fluid mechanically bottlenecked, 100% fuel efficient 4 core nuclear plant with perfectly timed circuit condition delayed fuel distribution… 
that's just one of those things. And it's done already. It barely took my bots 20 seconds to build a full thing. Now we prime each reactor with 3 fuel cells and wait for the thing to get up to temperature. So I said my nuclear plant is 100% fuel efficient. Now what do I mean by that? Fair warning, in the next minutes I'm going to explain exactly why and how this reactor is 100% fuel efficient. So if you're only here for the beer and the explosions, keep watching anyway because there's gonna be explosions. So what do I mean? Isn't all power in Factorio 100% fuel efficient? Like take the regular old steam power, it consumes only as much coal as the current power draw regardless of its maximum capacity. Not so with nuclear power. Nuclear reactors consume 100% of the fuel 100% of the time, regardless of if they need to power one light or one megabase. Before I continue I must disclose that in the Factorio universe there is no such thing as heat loss. If you pump 500 degree hot hot steam into a fluid tank it will stay in there being 500 degrees for forever. Now the reactors consume nuclear fuel and turn it into heat. Once the temperature of 500 degrees is reached, the heat exchanger starts converting that heat into steam. That steam is pumped through my steam buffer tanks to the steam turbines, which consume the steam and turn it into the end product, electricity. Now the steam turbines do consume the steam on an as needed basis, which means that given our current power need is less than 10% of this reactor's capacity, only a little bit of the produced heat is transformed into steam. Now, what do you think happens with all that excess heat? No, no, not yet, not yet. The excess heat gets stored in the system. The reactors and the heat pipes together form what is basically a giant buffer tank for storing heat. And like I mentioned, there is no heat loss in Factorio. All good so far. No energy wasted yet, no explosions. But here's the problem. The heat buffer is not infinite. The whole system can reach a maximum temperature of 1000 degrees. Now you ask, what happens when the temperature wants to exceed 1000 degrees? Well, believe it or not, in the early days of nuclear power the devs did actually have this plan to balance out how OP nuclear power actually is. Fortunately they dropped that idea and the temperature is just kept at 1000 degrees with any excess heat production just going to waste. However, that doesn't mean our 4 reactors stop consuming 4 fuel cells every 200 seconds. Oh no, those things are hungry and keep eating whatever you feed them with any excess heat production going to waste. So we need to feed them less. But how to achieve that? Like with bots, inserters only pretend to be your friends. Once you turn your back on them, they will insert up to 5 fuel cells in each reactor before they switch off. This again means wasted fuel. That's where this long belt and some circuit conditions come in. The explosions are finished by the way, so for the beer guys you can safely skip ahead now. Now we can't directly read temperature nor the amount of fuel cells in the reactor, so instead we hook up the fuel inserters to this steam tank. For as long as this steam buffer is full, the inserters are switched off. The nuclear reactors will run out of fuel and stop adding heat to the system. So then the question is, when does this steam buffer empty out? Well, not for as long as the excess energy in the heat buffer is ever so slowly being converted into steam. At some point though, the temperature of the heat buffer drops down all the way to 500 degrees, at which point the heat exchangers cannot operate anymore. They will stop producing steam and the steam tank will empty out. That sends a signal down the green wire which enables the fuel inserters at the nuclear reactors again. The inserters insert any available fuel cells again into the reactors and the reactors start adding heat to the system once again. Now obviously there is quite some delay between the moment the inserters feed fuel to the reactors and the heat building up through the system enough to reactivate the heat exchangers and fill up the measured steam tank once again. That is why we have the big steam buffers between the steam turbines. 
Those keep the steam turbines from running out of steam for long enough to overcome that delay, and the reactor's heat overproduction will quickly compensate for the downtime. So that whole thing regulates the inserters switching on and off at the right time, but how do we keep them from inserting 6 fuel cells in the reactor when we want them to feed only one? Well, I tried to tell them directly, but they won't listen to me, or at least I haven't found a way to get them to listen. So instead of telling them directly, we need to regulate the amount of fuel cells they have access to. That's where the delayed part of the setup comes in, in the form of this long, long, slow yellow belt. The chests near the reactor contain only one fuel cell each. The fuel master chest on top contains all the fuel, and only deploys fuel when these inserters insert the fuel into the reactors. Now, for as long as these inserters still are enabled, they want to insert up to 5 more fuel cells in the reactor, but too bad for them, the chests are empty. And keeping those chests empty for long enough is the task of this belt. Once the fuel finally reaches the chest, that measured steam buffer tank is long full again, and the treachery yellow inserters have been switched off again by the circuit network. Once the fuel passes by the chests, the blue inserters insert one and only one fuel into each chest, after which the remaining fuel is transported back into the fuel master chest. And while the nuclear reactors burn through their fuel cells with a passion, the produced heat energy from those single fuel cells can be fully stored into the system, no matter how low our current power demand is, and that is the key concept behind this 100% fuel efficient setup. Now, there are some things to take into account. The higher the actual power demand is, the higher the actual steam consumption is, and the longer it will take for the buffer steam tank to fill up again and switch off the inserters. If you supply the chest with bots, or if you make a short belt, the yellow inserters can still be active when the fuel reaches the chests, and they'll start bulk inserting fuel into the reactors. Basically, the longer you make this belt, the higher the power demand can be before the system loses its fuel cell saving ability. Now, this specific bell design not only looks cool, but it also delays the fuel delivery by my non-scientifically determined self-proclaimed optimum of about 90 seconds, which in practice turns out to save fuel until we're using about 80% of this reactor's capacity. After that, the insert only one fuel cell mechanism breaks, and the reactors gain access to more fuel. This is intended though, to ensure full fuel availability once the accordingly high demand is there, to prevent possible power spirals of death. Anyway, the potential fuel cell savings when operating at 80% capacity are insignificant. For every 8 useful fuel cells consumed, 2 extra would be wasted. Compare that to the current power draw of 10%. For every 10 useful fuel cells consumed, 90 would be wasted, for a total wasted fuel cell rate of 900%. To summarize, this setup is especially useful now when the power demand is low, as that's when the fuel saving effect is the greatest. Our reactor can supply 480 megawatts, but as long as we're only using a tenth of that, or 48 megawatts, our fuel cells will last 10 times longer than in a regular setup. Once we're up to a fifth of the reactor's capacity, or 96 megawatts, that drops to a 5 times longer fuel cell lifetime. At 240 megawatts, which is half the capacity of the power plant, we still stretch double the lifespan out of our fuel cells. And finally, at 400 megawatts, which is about 80% capacity, it's down to just one and a quarter times longer, barely noticeable anymore. By that time, we should be thinking about expanding power rather than saving fuel cells. Phew. I hope that was somewhat easy to follow, but if you skipped ahead to this point, I don't blame you. Anyway, now we switch to practically pollution-free nuclear power, it means we can phase out the polluting steam power plant. And we can finally get rid of this rectangular eyesore. Thanks to our completely electricity independent flamethrower defense, I can place complete faith in the nuclear power plant. So bye bye backup steam power plant. And 
Bye Bye Old Base. With the latest acquired technologies, we are going to build a brand new base from scratch over here. But first, we need to bless the Holy Lands. Let's cleanse the full base of cliffs with our chest full of cliff explosives. These cliffs. Those cliffs. The cliffs at the coal mine. Oh right, there are no cliffs at the coal mine. Then we go full gorilla style and take out these cliffs in the forest. I destroyed these cliffs to aid the biters and this is my tanks. Alright, let's not forget these formerly formerly forgotten cliffs. And another forest. We have quite some range thanks to our whopping 8 roboports. And that was it, we are all done. We take some stacks of electric furnaces with us, as well as a boatload of other building materials. And yet another boatload of stuff hidden in the crafting queue. It is time to build our new base. 